Hi guys, I'm Mike. And I'm Stephen. And this is Indie Fanatics, your home for indie car content with weekly podcasts and feature videos. Welcome back to the channel and to another feature video. Last time out we looked at the career of new IndyCar driver Roman Grosjean, so if you haven't already, check that one out. Don't forget, if there is a driver team or topic you'd like us to look at in the future, comment below. But today we look into a decision USAC made in the 70s as impact implications arguably still affect IndyCar today. The loss of the Marlboro title sponsorship. Thanks to Kirk Riley for the suggestion and we hope you enjoy. First we have to put into context why motorsport became an attractive option for cigarette brands. 1970 the Public Health Cigarette Smoking Act was agreed and would come into enforcement from the 2nd of January 1971. This forced cigarette packaging to put a stronger health warning on for its customers, but more importantly, TV and radio advertising would be banned. Cigarette companies had been pouring millions of dollars into advertising on these platforms, and now that was gone, and they were left seeking a new way to advertise their products. One way was on billboard advertising. The other way was through sponsorship. NASCAR's Junior Johnson, a highly successful driver and owner in the series, saw an opportunity to bring this money in and contacted RJ Reynolds, the owner, of the Winston cigarette brand. During discussions to enter the sport, it became clear that the TV technology to blank out the cigarette sponsorship on cars wasn't available. Interest peaked, and when RJ Reynolds' ambitions became loftier to sponsor the series rather than just one team, Johnson put him in contact with the France family. What ensued was a lucrative partnership that spanned from 1971 to 2002 that saw both brands grow together and resulted in NASCAR becoming the premium motorsport series in the United States. But what about IndyCar? Well, IndyCar also attracted interest from cigarette brands. That brand was Marlboro, the world's best-selling brand since 1972, and they wanted to sponsor the American Open Wheel Series. They first approached USAC in March of 1970, and a deal would be agreed between the two parties, but it was too late for a complete rebrand that season. Yet Marlboro would still contribute $25,000 to the point fund payout to the top three finishers and promote the series both locally and nationally. Both parties were happy with the 1970 success, and the partnership was eagerly continued continued with a greater presence of Marlboro brand within the sport. In exchange, USAC received $500,000 and the series would be renamed the Marlboro Championship Trail. The cigarette brand would also increase their contributions to the points fund from $25,000 to $75,000. The season was a success and both parties were happy with how the partnership was progressing. The 1972 deal was being discussed and again Marlboro were looking to increase their sponsorship contribution with a proposed $150,000 being added to the points fund and increasing the season ending points payout deeper into the field. Things were looking bright for USAC and the American Open Wheel Racing, a series sponsor that was increasing its financial support year on year. Top talents driving in the series such as the Answer Brothers, AJ Foyt, and Mario Andretti and the premium event the Indy 500 was growing in popularity year on year. Well all good things come to an end, just nobody anticipated it would be this quickly. From 1970 the team owned by ex-USAC driver Parnelli Jones and his business partner Vel Meltic had come into and dominated the series. Al Unser had won the 1970 championship and Indy 500 while retaining his 500 crown in 1971 as teammate Joe Leonard won the championship. On December 14th 1971, the team announced a new corporate sponsor for the 1972 season, the Brown and Williamson Company, who promoted the Viceroy cigarette brand. The deal was said to be worth millions, and Mario Andretti was added to an already talented roster of Al Unser and Joe Leonard. They would form what would be known as the Super Team. All three cars would be clad in the Viceroy colours, and that would include the logo plastered all over the car and driver uniforms. On top of this, Vel Parnelli Jones had attracted Morris Phillip from Lotus to design the car and top mechanic George Bignotti to set it up. That car would be called the VPJ1. Surprising enough, Marlboro were not happy about this. Having dominated the past two seasons honours, it was fair to assume that the Viceroy sponsor team would be competing at the top end of the field again, and that would mean a series that Marlboro was investing heavily in was providing marketing and advertising for an industry rival. Marlboro wanted USAC to push Viceroy out of the series and put a halt to the deal. USAC had two options. 
Support Marlborough, the company who was promoting the whole series and increasing their investment in the series year on year, or to support the series' most successful team over the past two seasons, who also had three of the best drivers in the series competing for them, who had just secured a lot of money coming into the sport. USAC decided on the latter, and Marlborough left anchored by the decision, withdrew their support and sponsorship for the series. The benefit of hindsight is a wonderful thing. Marlborough's suspicion of Val Parnetti's success would be well-founded as they would win the 1972 title with Joe Leonard, making it back-to-back -back championships. The team would then focus their efforts on F1. Although Viceroy would stay as a sponsor to 1975, they then left and USAC was left without both Marlborough and Viceroy. We can't say for certain how long the Marlborough deal would have lasted with USAC, but we can make pretty good guess that it would have lasted at least as long as the Winston Cup deal and here's why. Marlboro decided against supporting a series in the future and instead took their money to F1 to support individual teams. In 1972 they partnered with BRM and 73 and 74 Frank Williams Racing. The 1974 would see the start of what would become F1's longest sponsorship partnership in the history of the sport as they joined forces with McLaren in a deal that saw the two companies work together till 1996. And from 1997, Marlboro would become Ferrari's title sponsor until 2011. The partnership with McLaren helped see the team gain its first constructors title and the year that also saw Emerson Fittipaldi win the driver's title. In 1986, the cigarette brand would return to IndyCar and also partner with Emerson Fittipaldi again with Patrick Racing and in 1990 when Roger Penske signed Fittipaldi he would begin a 20 year association with the brand sporting what had become the, an iconic livery for Marlborough with the white car and a red stripe. Marlborough showed that they were committed and a loyal brand to the partners. Not only did USAC drive the sponsor out of their sport for over a decade but also into the arms of their single seat arrival and the financial support is just one of the fallouts of this decision. IndyCar has been through two splits in the series, once in 1979 between USAC and CART and the other between CART and the IRL in 1996. Now both of these splits were complicated issues and cannot be simplified to just one issue. However, if you were to pick just one, one of the big reasons for the 1979 split was the fact that the American open wheel racing compared to F1 was relatively poor in terms of financial gain and CART was set up to create a more profitable environment for the drivers and teams. If Marlboro had stayed, who to say that IndyCar wouldn't have been in a more financially secure place at the end of the decade? And you can make a pretty big argument to suggest that the first split wouldn't have happened. And if the first split hadn't happened, there's a pretty good argument to say that neither would the second. The financial loss of Marlborough and the opposite success that NASCAR experienced with the Winston brand meant that IndyCar had already lost ground to NASCAR in the race to become the biggest motorsport in America. The two splits sealed IndyCar's fate of where it currently sits in the shadow of NASCAR's success. Sponsorship was an important factor to secure in the 1970s and it is still an important factor today. With it not being as popular as NASCAR in the States or globally like F1 and even a new series like Formula E has taken over in terms of drawing eyes in fume figures, it becomes harder for the series to secure those sponsorships and title sponsors in particular as in the last decade going through three title sponsors in IZOD, Verizon and its current sponsor, NTT Data. But even teams have struggled. With Chip Ganassi having previously had a large sponsoring target, they now have a split sponsorship between PNC Bank, NTT Data, and Husky Chocolate. And it's reported that the personnel and the team, including Scott Dixon, all earn less now than they did five or even ten years ago. The drivers, in fact, are probably the big losers overall. In an article by Business Insider in 2019, they listed out the 14 highest paid drivers in the world. None of those included IndyCar drivers, and seven NASCAR drivers made the list. At the bottom end, some IndyCar drivers are barely making a living compared to other top athletes in the world of motorsport, which seems wrong with the quality of drivers 
that the series possesses. Losing the Marlborough sponsorship was a decision that no one at USAC foresaw the consequences of, and it is easy to look back on a decision and say they made the wrong choice. But we have almost 50 years of information to base our opinion on. They had a choice, a 50-50 choice, and unfortunately for IndyCar, they chose the wrong one. The late Chris Ekonomaki, a well-renowned name in the motorsport journalism industry and then publisher and editor of the National Speed Sports New, gave his damning verdict on the people involved for USAC in these negotiations, stating, Marlborough's departure also illustrates the fact that many people in the sport at high levels showed their ineptitude in dealing with these complex issues. They simply didn't know how to make the proper contractual arrangements concerning these types of relationships. They simply took all the money from sponsors as it was coming in, not yet recognising that these companies had rights associated with these payments. The positive for IndyCar now is it has a great product entertaining racing, star drivers and a premium event with the Indy 500 and plenty of teams with the history of the sport flowing through them. They also now have the one man in the history of IndyCar who has an incredible successful resume in terms of securing long-term sponsorship within the sport, Roger Penske, who can hopefully lead the ship forward to greener pastures. With the way we are watching entertainment with the rises of companies like Netflix and Amazon Prime, the way we watch sport will no doubt change as well and this could be another big moment the history of the sport in terms of nailing the streaming services and how you get your content to your viewers. Penske should look to the leaders in the industry in Formula 1 and its success with its series on Netflix, Drive to Survive and the Chasing the Dream series on its own streaming platform F1 TV and how that has helped to engage and grow a new fan base expanding the sport with a younger audience. But that's it for today's video. A massive what if moment and how would the landscape of auto racing in America and potentially single seaters be different if USAC had maintained their relationship with Marlboro? I guess we'll never know, but certainly a huge moment in the history of IndyCar. Don't forget if there's a driver, team or topic you'd like us to discuss in the future, comment down below. And if they're new around here and haven't done so already, Stephen, they can like, subscribe and ding that bell. Ding it. So for now, you indie fans, keep racing.